Welcome back everyone to The Charismatic Voice. I am here today with Tommy Kadavik, whose name is very difficult to say and I just had a lesson in it. Tommy, can you tell everyone in the world how exactly to say your name? Absolutely. Thanks for having me though. I'm super stoked <laughs> oh, yeah. to be here. Um, yeah, so my name in Swedish would be Tommy Kadavik. Tommy Kadavik. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> But for people that are in um, maybe just an English speaking country, it, Tommy is good? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. Okay. Uh, Tommy Karavik is usually what people say. Oh, that's it's pretty close, actually. It's not too far off. Not too far off. It's a little more Americanized. It's a little <laughs> co cooler sounding, I guess. Oh, mm, cooler. Yeah. Well, yeah. speaking of uh, cold or hot, uh, the first and maybe one of the most important questions in all our interviews is tea or coffee? You know what? It's been tea my whole life uh, until basically this last recording session with Seventh Wonder that we just went through. Oh. Um, and uh, I don't know. I suddenly, suddenly I turned 40 and I needed coffee, I think. <laughs> my, system, my system had, you know, told me enough of this already start drinking coffee and I so I, I did and <laughs> my wife uh, has been trying to get me to drink coffee with her sometimes but I, I've just never really latched on because I didn't I guess I didn't really get it mm -hmm. um, but now I get it oh, you get it yeah yeah like but I, I love tea yeah, yeah <laughs> I've had, had a lot of tea tea drinking during my during my uh, life leading up to this coffee drinking, so. So, it's so interesting. Um, the I've heard often that coffee um, will sometimes bother singers as they get older. They'll feel like, oh my goodness, yeah, the caffeine, maybe that gave me too much of a jolt for me sometimes. It makes my vibrato a little too fast. <laughs> yeah. But that's interesting. Then you've gotten older and now you're like, oh yeah, coffee's the way to go. <laughs> oh, and that's, that's just because uh, it actually helps you with your uh, energy if you need to do stuff, right? Oh, At yeah. least for me. But but um, I don't think I'm going to drink coffee once. I haven't tried drinking coffee and, and, and actually mixed with singing. So I don't know what that's going to do. I think it might dry your vocal cords out a little bit. Um, it's, it, it is, you know, because of caffeine, it does create some drying effect, dehydrating effect on the body. But if you're drinking lots of water with it, yeah. it can be evened out oh yeah okay yeah i'll have to try it i'll have to try it but um no tea thanks for sending me this tea it's really really lovely uh, i'm going with the uh, blueberry rooibos because i like fresh and fruity things and that i love that blueberry rooibos too it is so it's right it's like bright and just mm. incredible i've got um i've got a green honey bush essentially today because it's very very soothing and we're seven and a half months into pregnancy so soothing is oh, really wow. good right now. <laughs> congratulations that's mm -hmm. awesome Thank wow you. exciting Thank you. yeah it's good yeah. <laughs> well um you mentioned you got married um or you mentioned your wife earlier cobra right and you guys got married in 2020 early 2020 first of all congratulations to you thank you <laughs> that's wonderful thank you um, and was she then the reason that you moved from Sweden to Canada? Oh yeah, a hundred percent. We um, we actually managed to to um, move before, right before COVID hit, and uh, so COVID kind of we moved here, and then I think a month later or something, COVID hit. So mm -hmm. if that hadn't been the case, maybe we'd have we, we would have uh, spent more time apart this last couple of years here, but. Um, Oh. I, I, I quit firefighting, which was my main main job uh, in, back in Sweden, and then we moved here. And I was uh, suddenly a musician full-time. Whoa! So, yeah. Whoa, that's a big transition. <laughs> it was, yeah, moving to another country. And and I just have to say, too, like, I, I've, I'm, not, I'm not a born adventurer, if that makes hmm. sense. So I, I it's like... Uh, I, every, every shift in my life uh, takes a lot to do, 
for me because I'm I'm very security based and safety mm -hmm. based and uh, so yeah it was a big it was a big thing for person personality type of me to move to another country quit my day job and take a risk that way yeah it's very interesting to hear you describe yourself as not a born adventurer too when your main job before was fighting fires <laughs> Yeah, I guess so. Hey, that's a little contradictory, maybe. Uh, but I I understand that you don't you don't like to have tons of change, maybe. Yeah, I think I am definitely an introvert, right? Ah. So, mm -hmm. um, I I learned that learned that about myself not very long ago. So, uh, but it makes sense to me. Like uh, I'm, I, I like things the way they always been and, and uh, you know like s safety and security in routines and uh, a little bit and yeah I like solitude and... I feel that I, yeah. uh, most people I think uh, they think of a performer and they think immediately that person's extroverted but I, I liked uh, there's I guess sort of four extroversion description there's an introverted introvert or an extroverted introvert introverted extrovert and extrovert extrovert <sighs> it's a lot wow that is a lot but i think um i really identify as well with um an extroverted introvert meaning that i'm fundamentally introverted but i tend to gather all my energy up so that it can um really be given to an audience of some sort or maybe given to friends at a party in some situation. I, I gather that energy and then I'll go let it burst somewhere and then I have to go retreat and hide and gather my energy back up again. Yeah, that sounds very familiar <laughs> to me too. It's uh, even when I, when I started figuring out that I had this uh, way of being, I, I could, even when I'm surrounded by the ones I love, right? Like my family, my, my closest family, Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be very many people either. I still find myself in the bathroom without having to go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. like uh, staring into the mirror, like, what am I doing? You know, and hiding like, away. Yeah. Yeah. And like, I just got to charge up a little bit. And it's yes. not because I don't love these people. I love them with all my heart and I want to be with them. And, uh, but, but that's kind of when I realized like, what's actually happening here, you know, like, but yeah. um, I think, when you know these things about yourself, it's easier to, to know when to say yes and when to say no and um, how to go about gatherings with people. And yeah. <laughs> totally, totally agree. 100%. Um, well, I have a whole bunch of questions and like papers and, and stuff, like all kinds of things to ask you. So I, I want to get into a little bit about how you've come to be such an incredible artist because you are really incredible and uh, I've been looking Thank forward you. to getting to talk with you literally for over a year <laughs> so that's, um, that's awesome thank you so much cool. first and foremost that's really nice to hear well, I mean, you do amazing things so it's it's really great thank you for being an inspiration but I'd like to know a little bit about um sort of your journey and maybe we should just start at the beginning, especially because I know you sometimes sing with your sister Jenny on yes. uh, Seventh Wonder tracks. So, what was family like growing up? Right? Did you guys have fun holiday sings? Yeah, I mean, I've had a lot of time to think about these things, like how it actually started. Because I didn't, I didn't really know. So I, I just like it just happened organically somehow. But music mm -hmm. has definitely always been in our family. Like uh, my mom, she, my dad played guitar, like not very good, but he, he, you know, it was music. He was very musically interested uh -huh. uh, and, uh, you know, had a huge record collection. And um, my mom, she sang in the choir for fun, you know, so it has, music has definitely been always around, but not on a professional level. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know. Uh, my sister started, she was, she went to school for singing mm -hmm. and uh, she was the one that actually was m the most professional oh, artist wow. uh, for a long, for the longest time. She would, I would always hear her in the room singing with her piano and she sang, uh, she sings amazing. Right. So, um, 
I've always heard her sing, but I was more of a sports guy. Mm-hmm. I would be I would be in the school play and like acting and and uh, singing in the school choir just because I thought it was fun. You know, it's a fun activity, and I love yeah. music, so why not? But um, yeah, so that's how you know I, I didn't think much of it. I just it was always there. But then I started. I don't know if you if you call it high school or w- what's actually high school. High school. Oh. How old are you in high school? Um, it's usually I think around fourteen or fifteen to eighteen. Yeah. So high school. Uh, I met. I, I must have been right around fifteen or sixteen. I met mm-hmm. a guy called Johan. Uh, we went to the same. Was the same uh, class, and. Um, he was an amazing, he is an amazing guitar player, and he was writing songs in Swedish. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I was just so inspired. Like, I, I, I was like, I want to do that too. I, have a, I feel like I have a lot of music in me. Uh, and I want to, it just really inspired me the way he played the guitar and, and was able to write lyrics and, and uh, express himself. And uh, this is this. He was doing metal music, right? If I, if I've done my research correctly, this was one of the times you got into metal, or is this a different person? Yeah, this is a. It's, it's a, It goes hand in hand with that. Like he he wasn't okay. writing metal music, but he was listening to metal music. Ah. So the my first inspiration was him as a musician, playing the guitar and, and singing in Swedish, uh, and. Uh, but at the same time, since we we ha- we started hanging out and and all that, um, he introduced me to the music that he was li- that he was listening to, which was metal, mm-hmm. among other things. But but melodic metal, uh, oh. and that was the first time I've ever heard metal when uh-huh. I was like sixteen, maybe seventeen. <laughs> um, I was like, whoa, because these singers they were just singing their asses off, right? Like. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, I that sounds so great. Like, I want to, I want to also be able to sing like that. So I guess I just started listening, started listening to these uh, bands. It was Dream Theater. Oh, okay. I was going to ask about that. So Dream Theater was one of the main ones. Who else? Yeah, and it was because I heard a ballad from one of the records, uh, Scenes from a Memory. Mm-hmm. Uh, the ballad is called um, Spirit Carries On. Oh. And and I, it was introduced to me as metal, but it's really nothing metal about it. So uh-huh. that's probably why I liked it, because I came from pop and all this other stuff. Yeah. Um, and like si- singing divas, like like uh, Mariah Carey and Whitney Houston and mm-hmm. all those those uh, people. That's you know with voice, <laughs> huge voices, and uh, but this was something that resonated with me too, because it had like it's just a very well written. Yeah, uh, mu- music, and um, I like the way James sang on that track. So. Well, yeah, he's incredible too. Great, great person to to follow. Um, so uh, this actually gets kind of to this core question, which I'm really curious about your thoughts on, which is how how do you think singing changes when you're in different genres? This, this comes because I heard you singing an acoustic version of uh, Against the Grain. And it was really, really stunning, beautiful. And every now and then I think, okay, it almost sounds like he has pop influences in there. And I'm like, no, 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 it's just, it's totally metal. And do you think that you shift if you're singing something that's acoustic versus full metal on stage costume? Um, And do you think that your background, you know, starting maybe up through age 15, mostly hearing some pop music and then getting into metal afterwards you think that's affected your stylization totally it totally uh i mean i was basically just listening to pop and and 
up until I found metal, right? And so I wasn't colored by any old Iron Maiden or mm. or or uh, Metallica or anything that most people that love metal they they start somewhere there, like yeah, in in yeah, and then they they have that template growing up a little bit. So that kind of I think that made me a little different, come from a different. Uh, come from a different angle, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, without all this uh, stuff that I I should have heard, you know. So I, I, I started and I did my own thing pretty fast. Like I, I started doing a bunch of ad libs and a bunch of things that you would hear in pop, but <laughs> I didn't hear in this in this music. Before. Yeah, you add lots of runs and it, it sounds great. Again, I remember I talked with Aryan recently about um, you and, and the way you're just able to embellish with runs so easily. He's like, oh yeah, he's great at that. <laughs> Essentially, <laughs> it's fun. Yeah. So, well, do you think that was maybe like a little Mariah Carey brought into metal? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I think I have. If I would analyze my own singing, which I never have, but <laughs> when I look at it from an, from a bystander's standpoint, I think. It must have come from there. Uh-huh. I spent like a whole summer just singing a Mariah Carey, one Mariah Carey song when I was Which 15. One? Which one? <laughs> uh, whenever you call. <laughs> and it's like full of ad libs, right? It, yeah. Like it's just an ad lib soup. <laughs> but it's really great if you want to uh, learn, if you want to practice your runs. And I think, I think the formative years for me was when I was between maybe 14 and 17, 18, when I was listening mm-hmm. to these things and trying to do the same thing. Wow. You, you went straight into one of the things I wanted to ask about too, which was how did you practice your runs? And the answer is you sang along with Mariah Carey. <laughs> yes, I, w- I would say so. <laughs> wow. uh, and, uh, you know, I would, I would sing everywhere. I would sing in my room. I would sing in the car. I would sing uh, when I actually had a car. Uh, <laughs> but I would just... I remember this vividly when I when I just one day out of the blue um, I had my friend Johan that I was talking about on the <laughs> phone he was doing the military service and um, we just had we were on the phone together and I said I asked him to listen to something that I recorded on my portable little studio and there was an, a Sonata Arctica song I don't know if you know oh, who Sonata yeah. Arctica is yeah yeah and we had we had the love for that band to, uh, uh, in common, so uh-huh. I I just gave it a try, and he was like, I think he almost like fell off his chair or something. He said <laughs> he was like, when? Like he didn't even know that I was even, that I even started singing, you know. Mm-hmm. And then he he was uh, he was like, oh, I can't believe it. You just suddenly wow. just can't. You can just sing. Yeah. Is, I don't know. I can't remember that very well, but I I know that it must have been. I must have practiced. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, there probably was some practice. Yeah, but I loved it so much that I didn't consider it practice. Is what I think. Mm, that's good. Right? You don't yeah. want to don't want to beat something to death that you love and, and lose the love of it. Yeah. And, and, I, and at the same time, I think I did a lot of tra- ear training listening to my sister because we, we mm. think music similarly. And we do we do runs similar similarly too. Well, like um, the way she would do a run, it, it's usually what I would do. And and so we have, I think I have ear. I conditioned my ear just listening to her, and then I just took it to myself somehow. I, it's what I'm guessing. That that makes a ton of sense. And there's something about seeing with a family member too. I think the maybe sort of having similar genetics, maybe just a a similar also physical design, right? Everybody's got a different vocal tract and different bone structure that's going to make their sound different. But when you have somebody who is directly related, there are often ways you can sort of link into the sound or you have so many cultural um, familiarities that you're able to get on the same wavelength often as oh, a family yeah. member. Yeah, I think so. And I think, I, when I listen to our voices together for in in a Seventh Wonder song, for example, or when we sing live together, it's uh, it's like a male and a female 
voice of the same voice, That's if you know awesome. what I mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so they blend really nice together. The textures blend really nice, and the way we think, I think, mm-hmm. also blends nice. So yeah. it's really fun to sing with her. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's really awesome that you're able to do that with your sister. Yeah, I think she's a way better singer than me, though. But that's a different uh, that's a, a different topic. So she she went to music school, you said, but you didn't. You just kind of were figuring things out on your own, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just because of love of love for music and uh-huh. and so- I I to this day I don't even consider myself an amazing singer i i definitely consider myself more of a musician or or a storyteller than a than a singer mm. but storytellers are just essentially singers also i think that you just are elongating speech to become a singer and maybe using a wider range of pitches but yeah yeah well i, I it's still weird to me when i'm like you you're a singer you and i'm like I've never even thought of, like, I don't think of myself as a singer. When I think of a singer, I think of other singers, <laughs> not me. Uh, and I, th- I think of myself as, like, I just had to figure the singing out because I wanted to tell a story. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. I had to figure the singing out because I wanted to tell a story. That's, mm. that's so good. So many singers end up singing and thinking, oh, I just want to make a pretty sound. And they miss the entire idea of, I need to communicate something. And yeah. you definitely came at it the other direction. I want to communicate something, so I need to learn how to sing this. Yeah, and it's, it, it comes back in, I was trying to th- think about this um, leading up to this interview too. I was like, what, uh, why do I think I started, or, or, or why do I, did I uh, this music turn into this music that I'm doing and the way I'm singing? And I think it's because I know really well, I know exactly what I want to hear. Uh, the mm-hmm. way it's, you know, for me, it's the, the emotional aspect is the absolute most important thing. And um, the way I, I go about creating that emotion is just uh, interpreting the note, right? The note and the and the word I'm singing uh-huh. it has to be interpreted in in an emotional way. And I know what I want to hear, uh, so I go for the sound, and I, then I have to figure out how to make that sound to to match what I want to hear. <clears throat> That's so, cool. Ooh. Yeah. So it, all these nuances, like where to place them, I don't think about where to place them. Mm-hmm. I think about how they sound. That's good. What about um, when you are when you are doing an embellishment? Is there do you often attribute a certain emotion to that, or a certain thing that you're looking to communicate with that embellishment? I think emo- emotion. Again, I was t- trying to think about how do, how do I approach this. For me, it has to be a journey. Hmm. It has to be uh, has a starting point and ending point, and it ha- and it's very visual to me. Uh-huh. what it has to be. I see music in shapes and colors. Whoa. So what um, kinds of shapes and colors? Like I can see if I, if the track is from A to B, I, I, I need to see the, I see the vocal melody as a, as a line. Uh-huh. Uh, and the whole song in generally, or, or par- parts of the song in colors. Like maybe if some sort of synesthesia then. Yeah, uh, yeah, and mm-hmm. uh, for me, it's very. I'm very sensitive to if the shape is not right, for huh. example, or if the color is not right. Oh, that's cool. That um, that gives a really interesting um, sort of top-down perspective that I think must be incredibly wonderful to work with as a colleague. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know how it is. I think it probably sucks to work with me because I'm very picky. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm very, I, I, I guess I'm a perfectionist, which is not good. Mm-hmm. Like it's not, it's not easy for people around me mm-hmm. and it's also not easy for me either. Cause, mm-hmm. uh, but that's just always what it's been. I know exactly what I want and I'm not happy. Even if someone else says it's good, I have to <laughs> be happy myself. Yeah. I also feel you there and very much relate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. No. It's, uh, 
was there i was reading that um I was reading a little bit about that perfectionism. I think it was in a recording recording session in 2008. I think that was with Seventh Wonder. And that you ended up sort of maybe running into some troubles of recording things over and over and over, getting kind of vocally tired. Is this ringing a bell or am I way off base? No, uh, I, that's happened to me every time I record, basically. So, oh. But, it, but it's uh, because, I, because I have this... Uh, that has to sound a certain way and mm -hmm. maybe I'm not quite capable of doing it right away. So I'm like, I got to figure I got to learn it as I do it. Yeah. And then, then I know it, but it takes me a while. So um, what do you do to take care of yourself when you're doing these huge recording sessions? I don't anymore. I don't do these rec huge recordings if I can uh, help it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I tend to do shorter ones. Oh, that's smart. <laughs> that's really yeah. smart. <laughs> yeah. The answer like is I, don't do huge recording <laughs> sessions. Do shorter yes. ones. <laughs> do shorter ones. Yeah, I think that's my my takeaway. Because, yeah, it was in 2014 when I really hurt myself. Um, oh yeah. In a, re in a recording session, I um, it was at the end of like eight nine hours, which usually wasn't oh. a a problem for me before, but that's suddenly it was a problem. It was yeah. a long time. Um, yeah. And I was just stubborn really stubborn and I at the end of the day I still had to sing the last note which ex exactly I knew how how it had to sound it had to be this epic note that went from clean high to a little bit of grit with oh. vibrato and then <laughs> and then and then, and then uh, uh, embellishment at the end that I knew exactly how I wanted to with a little bit of air at the end Ooh. so I wanted I, yeah I needed it to be a certain way and I could, just couldn't get it after eight hours. I was like, this it didn't feel good. Mm -hmm. I just kept on doing it and doing it and doing it until I, I don't think I did nail it, no. Uh, so I had to go home, but I started to feel hoarse. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this doesn't feel good at all. So, But then the next morning I had no voice. And uh, that was apparently because I, I, I had a big bleeding in one of the, um, oh. vocal cords. You um, start to have a little hemorrhage, essentially. Yeah. So my voice yeah. is gone for a month or yeah, something like this. And um, I had no idea. I had heard it so bad. I thought I was sick. Ah. Uh, so I, I tried every time the voice came back, I tried to sing, but I couldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, 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 I uh, opened the hemorrhage time and time and time again. Oh. Uh, which uh, yeah, it didn't didn't work. But then, I think it was a half a year or a year later. I I, I went to a doctor. I was like, mm -hmm. I can't sing anymore. And yep. there's a there's a a show with Camelot coming up on Sweden Rock on the main stage in front of thirty thousand people. I need to I need to be able to sing, and that's four days away. Ah! Oh my goodness, four days to recover. <laughs> yeah, four four days to recover, and uh, after not being able to sing for a year, so. Uh, I went to this uh, guy and he looked down my throat and he said, "Yeah, you have, you have an old damage. Like it's still swollen because ah. you're you're trying to, yeah." He's but um, after it. Yeah, but uh, so he, did he they described do the, it. Did they do the the camera that went up the nose and then down, or just the one that goes straight? No, back? just the one that goes straight. that went into my throat. I think. Yeah. Right. That makes you gag a lot. It's like, yes. oh gosh, there's a metal yeah. tube in the back of my throat. Yeah. Right. Yes, and then it's like you have to try to sing a note, which is impossible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, does, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's yeah. it's like I can't actually sing, you know. Yeah. But uh, yeah, what was I supposed to say? Um, so four days before you you find out you got. Yeah, and and this, it was still like this, uh, like the vocal folds were one was trying to move and the other one was just. Stable. It was kind of stiff, essentially. Yeah, it was just too yeah. thick and didn't move. Okay, uh, so you had a little scar tissue, essentially, that had built up then. I think so. It must have been. Uh, okay. And then, but he sent me to uh, an opera singer. I know oh. it's because you, you were schooled in <laughs> opera, but uh, yeah. uh, she she gave me this lax box tube. Oh, Talk to me yeah. about that lax lax yeah. vox tube. I I feel like that sounds familiar. Oh yeah, it's a she. It's a phonation tube. I think the one that she gave me was in glass. Was made of glass. Uh huh. 
uh, and you blow into water with it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so it's like a straw, essentially, it's, right? It's a straw, yeah. It's a straw that's supposed to be uh, kind of resem resembling your your air tube or your... Um, your vocal tract. Yeah, vo vocal tract, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to uh, help with, you know, massaging the vocal cords from the inside, like gentle vibrations. And yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, um, that's really smart. It sounds like she got you started on SOVT exercises, a semi occluded vocal tract exercises. Where do you do you still use these today? I do. I do for warm ups and Ooh. cool downs. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's exciting to I me. Do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The really vocal works. science nerd is all excited <laughs> at this moment. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's really working for me, and I, I, uh, I swear by it now because it, it saved my ass back in. 2014 when I had to be on that stage. Wow. So you were able to turn it around within four days using four days. a little bit of straw, essentially straw and water SOVT. Yeah. Yeah. That's and great. she said, you can't like, okay, you have four days. You can't sing. You can't say anything. These four <laughs> days, you got to be completely quiet. And then you use the straw for one minute every hour you're awake. And you don't even have to uh, sing into it or hum into it. You just blow into it or mm. use your diaphragm and, and like you would sing and uh, mm. and make an even airflow uh, mm. for a minute. Uh, and I did that, and I didn't open my mouth until I stood on the stage uh, at Sweden Rock in front of I don't know thirty thousand people. Was that scary, that moment? It was. You thought, I'm about to open my mouth and I haven't sung in four days. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I knew it, was, it wasn't going to work, right? So I thought my I thought my career was going to be over. Like, what am I going to do here mm -hmm. on the stage for one and a half hours with yeah. with this voice, like, uh, cutting out? So, but it, uh, I, I did a, I did the whole show without, without any cutouts, so. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, straw, I'm, I'm such a huge fan of, of singing through straws. It's just such, the research on it is really solid. The guy that is responsible um, for really bringing that to light, his name is Dr. Ingo Tietze. I ended up taking a course with him and have gone back to him multiple times now with questions. And we recently did a, a throat down camera procedure with uh, harsh metal vocalist, uh, Will Ramos. And it's the same thing where we're just, He's such an incredible mind and was able to essentially wow. apply physics to singing and explain to us why we needed to do things like sing through straws and that why this whole process is massaging, like you put it, for the vocal folds. And it's it's really wow. incredible. I think it just shifted. I know in, in my opera singing, it shifted how I sing immensely. And wow. I think it's shifted how we train people hugely in the last 20, 30 years. Even now, a lot of people are still finding out about straws and <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. And I, I try to be an advocate for it too because I, uh, I'm just blown away by what it did for me, right? Yeah. So, and I need kind of needed some something like that to be believing that something could actually help because it's it, the vocal folds and the vocal cords they're just a little. Mm -hmm mystical right they're just in there and you can't touch them and you can't do anything about it and that's where you feel really helpless as a singer if you have trouble so yeah so it's nice to have just some solid grounding in science that says hey do this and this and this and physically it will fix itself <laughs> yeah i i am so happy i don't even know like i was so relieved yeah of course the the problem wasn't gone after four days no. like i i had to keep kept keep working on it forever but but um, essentially, it t taught me to learn things about my new voice. That because my my voice after the damage was a little different than the, mm. the, you know. So it wasn't necessarily worse, but it was. I had to relearn a couple of things. Yeah, you know? and your confidence is shaken too. Yeah, which yeah. It, that's just that's so huge in singing. <laughs> yep. Yeah, and and then I, I feel like. My singing, it, it, it can, I've heard that people say it sounds so free, like you can sing, you can do a little bit whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But in my, in my 
uh, brain, I I know all everything. I know all the little uh, things that I'm avoiding in my voice to get to where where I want to go. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm actually feeling like a prisoner of my own voice sometimes when people say I sound so free. Huh. So it's it's very interesting. Like the more you know of, of, about your own voice, like the more actually like a framework that you have to be in somehow. I, I don't know. It's it's for me. It's it's um, becomes very apparent because people say it sounds so free, but I feel so captured. Do you feel like that's maybe because you know where the right pocket is that you know where you like your sound the most? So rather than feeling like, oh, I'll just do anything, you just yeah. are saying, I want it in this particular pocket or this, I want this particular sound. So it's such a, a narrow pathway to get there. Yeah, and then you just have to do this to, to get there. But mm-hmm. it, it's weird because... I've always felt kind of like I was trapped a little bit in my voice. Like I could, I, like I, uh, you know, you, you know, we're like, oh, and here comes the, here comes the crack point. Now I have to do something. And like, <laughs> I have to avoid this little thing. I have to, but people don't hear that because it's, yeah. you know, because you're, you're actually taking that detour. <laughs> yeah. Because you are, your job is to make it sound easy. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And it's actually is, very uh, hard. <laughs> it is hard. Yeah, it is hard. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's that's one of the things that I instantly, when hearing you, I had picked out as, wow. Um, I, I think it was probably a, a seventh wonder song in particular. So um, we have a, a Patreon and one of the tiers in it, they submit songs for me to play in Beat Saber. which is a, a VR video game. It generates these blocks that you slash and it, you just feel like a Jedi, but it's all timed and like programmed with this AI. So basically I'm like inside of a song and I was seeing uh, the seventh wonder for the first time. And I just thought, oh my gosh, the melodic lines, they're, they're huge. You are going over such a wide, range of pitches it's insane and then of course all of the different timbre shifts that you do and the runs that you do the embellishments it's it's really amazing and i think to a lot of people they think oh yeah he's got a big range but to my senior mind i'm going he's making so many tiny adjustments to make that actually work and sound like one voice <laughs> yeah thank you yeah it's yeah i i, I kind of had to learn that because I wanted I wanted to be able to sound a certain way I, and and sometimes I learn it as I'm recording it because I'm ah. maybe I couldn't do it before I before I recorded it but I had to had to figure it out to get the sound out if that ah. makes sense do you practice with a recording device sometimes too no <laughs> I hate my own voice like, <gasps> yeah so I am um, the less I hear of it the, the better <laughs> oh man, I, I so sincerely wish for you that you totally fell in love with your voice. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I think it's a little bit at this point. It's connected to. I don't hate my voice, but I don't, I don't necessarily <laughs> love it or want to hear it a lot of it because. Uh huh. Um, I even when I practice singing, which is very very dumb. Don't do this at home. <laughs> um, I practice singing with headphones on. Uh, so that I hear less of my own voice, huh. and uh, I can actually lean into my to the feeling the way I want it to feel, mm-hmm. instead of hearing all these little imperfections in my voice that I 
that I makes me tense up when I'm sing, when I'm singing. Well, that kind of does make sense though, because ultimately what you're going for is how do I make myself less tense when I'm practicing? Yeah. Right. Yes, sort of a, exactly. a novel method. I haven't heard. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Which is, you got you got to just take this with a whole handful of salt. But uh, this is how I. That's what I been doing like I when I practice a set for example I make sure I, sometimes I have the ear out a little bit like this so I can hear a little bit of my own voice but the, literally the least amount of voice that I can hear I want to hear so and then um, yeah when you're doing a sound check in a stadium yeah, yeah. you just tell them not to pipe any of you in <laughs> no yeah like <laughs> like in in uh in my in ears, I have very little of my voice when I wow. sing live. Very little, like just a, a, enough to hear the pitch. Yeah, wow. And then, uh, and then <laughs> it's it's that's how I practice too, right? Because I don't want to hear my voice <laughs> and and be freaked out how bad it sounds. Um, so I I've learned, I think through that I learned how it's supposed to feel. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a golfer that. Um, you know, if you're not supposed to feel the ball when you hit the ball, like, and then you, it, the ball flies like several hundred meters. But if you feel, if it hurts or if it feels weird, like a weird, weird vibration in the club, the ball will only go like a hundred meters because you, you didn't hit the ball right, right? It was huh. the wrong technique. You're not supposed to feel that you hit the ball at all. And that's how I feel when I sing. If I can sing the right notes without feeling them. I, I don't feel them at all. Like they, it's like um, uh, it just it, it feels right, it's, as opposed to a little strained, a little rough, mm -hmm. a little yeah. And then if I can if I can feel that or feel feel basically nothing and do it uh, a whole song through, then I know I, I will be able to do it without straining myself. Mm -hmm. It's it's basically how I've done it. Like I I just want very little of myself in my ears and be able to relax to the point where I don't feel my voice. That's that's really really insightful and I think has lots of like golden nuggets in there for singers to learn from because like you mentioned a lot of people hear your voice and we, and we think oh it's very free if you don't feel it getting caught anywhere there's no sort of impedance that you're finding within that vocal tract then that will contribute it to it sounding more free so that goal of not being able to feel your voice i think is an interesting way of saying you know you've developed a freedom of tone even though you have this very specific sound you're going for which makes you feel like you've got to keep it within a certain zone you're within that zone but then there's freedom within the actual mechanism yeah, I think so. I, I, it's very, I know it sounds, I've never heard anyone say this uh, before or because or, I know everyone wants to hear themselves a lot and they want to, you know, and I think I've been, I've been wondering like what's wrong with me because I, I wasn't at all like that. I just, you know, I, I went more for like if, if I hear my voice and I hear all the little things that I do wrong, I'm going to tense up and I'm going to, I'm going to, sing worse mm. that that's my whole philosophy like if i can just relax and trust that it sounds good knowing that I, i'll hit i'm hitting the pitch i'm relaxed and i'm not straining my voice and i'm not getting tired the same way yeah and that's super important when you're touring too to, that you're not getting super tense every night that it's relaxed because otherwise it's not going to be there after a week yeah exactly and i've been there too like i've the first thing you do is to scream when you when you're play, play, if you're not uh, used to playing live you just you, you use your voice too much you try mm -hmm. to overpower instruments and uh, maybe even god forbid the sound guy would will tell you, you have to sing louder to yeah. overpower you know and I, that's happened to me too and and of course you know you have to go through these stages as a live musician to understand oh, I, actually I can't sing louder because it's going to hurt my voice and then yeah. we don't have a tour instead yeah um, they turn my mic up let me bring it closer <laughs> yeah exactly or, or, 
and I learned very late actually in life uh, through Cobra's vocal coach. I, I went there once uh, mm. with her and um, she told me, she asked me to sing something. I was very shy about it. Um, and I, I did sing something and she said, oh, that's very interesting. Uh, mm. what, did, what, what kind of music are you doing again? <laughs> and uh, I was like, I was sing metal. <laughs> metal. And she's like, okay. Uh, well, you have a very rare type of voice for a metal singer. Like you have a very, you ha it's, she said it was um, called a light lyric tenor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, not very loud. <laughs> My voice is not loud. It's not meant to be loud. It's just meant to be uh, telling a story, I guess. Um, not over very loud music. So he's, she's like, I, I suggest you, you should uh, stop. <laughs> oh no, don't do that don't do no, that <laughs> no no i won't but um yeah so it was interesting i was like com very confused about it i was like oh but it made sense because i was like i was straining myself trying to sing over these loud instruments mm -hmm. you know? uh, um do you feel like the main two things that you're doing musically at this point is singing with seventh wonder and camelot right Yes. Do you ever feel like, oh my gosh, how, Roy Khan, how do I, how do I sing this like he did? Or do you just think about singing it like you do now? Well, there was definitely a, an element in the beginning where I tried to not make people disappointed, like try to yeah. have a certain, um, yeah, because you take over for someone that's very well respected and has a very distinctive sound. And um, it's kind of what carries the band in a way. Mm -hmm. um, many people listen to the singer. Uh, uh, and I do that too with my, with my favorite bands. Like I would be bummed if my s favorite singer, even if the, yeah. the new singer was good, I would have a hard time maybe. You know, I, so I was thinking, I did a lot of research on how he, he uh, would write melody, for example. Ooh. Like how he would, like what kind of intervals he was using, what notes he would use. Um, mm -hmm. um, I was trying to do, to make my own version of it, but use some of those elements to not stray too far from what people were used to. Mm -hmm. And that, and then the, the mood in the music kind of called for something theatrical and the way he was singing made sense to me, you know? So how does the writing between uh, the two bands at this point differ from a melodic and lyric standpoint for you? Uh, well, I had to learn. Yeah, as I said, I had to learn to write for Camelot because uh -huh. Seventh Wonder writing was very natural to me. It was very, it was more major, uh, more major, happy sounding, uh -huh. uh, huge soaring uh major sounding melodies that yes. yeah and uh that comes very natural to me uh what i had to learn was the minor on minor sound basically like the the dark brooding theatrical um maybe using some different notes to to not land on the on the root or on the on the third or the fifth but rather maybe you can land on the sixth or the ninth or, you know, like, but I didn't know what that was. I just knew how it sounded. So I, I you, you find the less obvious note, right? In, in the scale or, so that, that was a transition for me. You have to learn like, what is the actual template that we're using or the, the way of writing? Like what notes are we using and why, so. I, I have this like little rather big child in me right now, right? Who's like all like moving around is like, yeah, let's talk about landing on the third or the fifth or the sixth. And so yeah. funny. he's just like, I think that's a very exciting conversation point for him, just so you know. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Oh, totally. Yeah, you know all about it. So uh, <laughs> because you, you play the piano. Yeah. Right? And yeah, you, all my you, life. You have to know. Yeah, so you have to know, you know, all these scales and the notes and mm -hmm. what makes, makes a certain mood or. Yeah, it's really cool. I'm, I'm very, very fortunate that I, I got, 
uh, yeah, I had a lot of piano training for my mom from like, age four, but my siblings were also playing when I was young. So uh, yeah, I started early and then uh, actually almost uh, at first when I was going into music, I thought that I would be a concert pianist. Oh, and wow. then the voice really took off. So wow. <laughs> kind of cool. And then that carried you, carried you further than you probably thought you would ever go, hey? Eh? Like different stages around the world. Yeah, it really, I, I, I'm incredibly fortunate in that I got to take, yeah, voice around the world, but then also having those piano skills at the same time made it much easier for me to learn uh, various operas and, you know, mm. actually play the harmonies underneath myself so I could figure out how these things fit into chords and maybe why this note, like you mentioned, ends in a certain way and what kind of expression to give to that because it's an unusual ending yeah yeah like i always like the natural thing for me writing melodies is to resolve um somewhere down the line but mm -hmm. with, with camelot i had to learn that it's not you know sometimes is the, the the lack of resolve is the resolve yeah like, right uh, you know it's the ten the tension of some note is what makes the mood. So then I want to come back to the, the stylization of Roy Khan and, and fitting your voice into it. Did you ever feel like, I, there's sort of two questions I have. One is, did you ever feel like it was strange to sort of be in someone else's vocal skin? And also, do you think that that has developed your signature sound at this point? Well, yeah, I, it's, it was very different to what I would have done, like, naturally. So I had to learn how to do it. So it, at, mm -hmm. at, in the beginning, of course, it didn't feel quite like I was doing exactly what I would have done, which is then you, yeah, you put yourself in, in someone else's shoes a little bit. But as time went on and as it, it turned into one of my tools in my toolbox, uh, that I, so it feels much. It feels like me now when I when I sing the new Camelot stuff. It feels like me, and uh, but I might have learned something from from what I was doing to learn mm -hmm. how to fit into Camelot. Like I, that was that was just became me, right? Like you, <laughs> you you gain knowledge. That's what living is about, and what 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 being human is, is about, right? Like you you progress. You're not the same person as you were five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. You just you, ch you shape into something new all the time. Yeah. So I that's why I think I did. I, I I had to learn something, and then it became me. <laughs> that's really cool. Are there moments now when you're singing a Seventh Wonder song and you hear an influence of this new shape over there? Yeah. Oh, it definitely does because it yeah, it, and it comes out naturally that and and authentically not trying to be something it just it just becomes uh i guess a a new color in your in your uh, uh toolbox yeah. like you can you can use it and blend it in maybe not fully as much as i would do in camelot but i could use that as a color if i want to do something that i you know, it just adds, it just adds. It doesn't take away from anything, it just adds. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, recently, you've been doing recording sessions for both Seventh Wonder and Camelot, preparing for new albums. And uh, let's talk about Seventh Wonder because that's going to be released soon, right? I think it's June. Of, yeah, June 10th, I think. Right, of 2022. That's, that's great. And I'm, I'm very excited for it. And um, so, did you put more time between these different recording sessions so that you'd have a more clear distinction between Seventh Wonder and Camelot, or was that not really a concern? It's definitely a concern because uh, I I tend to like run myself to the ground with every recording, yeah. so I need I really need some time like in between. Like it didn't happen between the last Camelot album. Last Camelot album and last Seventh Wonder album and Arion uh, was oh, at the right. same the same time. Oh, so it was, that was really challenging. <laughs> it was it 
yeah, it was really problematic Whoa, there for a that's while. That's a lot at once. <laughs> yeah, and and all of them were slightly different styles and yeah. and different, but the same singer. So you have to kind of clone yourself in a weird way and do things. It wasn't it wasn't good it wasn't good for me. But yeah. Yeah. in opera, we we have um, sort of distinct times when we would study certain roles and you don't want to study two that are vastly different from each other at the same time even though it's your yeah. same voice yeah it just that it, makes that's sense pretty exhausting so yeah three three different major recording projects at the same time oh boy <laughs> yeah and and like i didn't feel like i had voice enough for one so <laughs> it was a tough it was tough uh you know it, it all worked out but it, it wasn't it left me kind of like a wreck after yeah and uh, but but this time I worked on Camelot, uh, and then we worked for for a long time on it. And when the, my recordings time? were done, uh, a long time. It was spread out because it was COVID, right? So it was a little spread out. Yeah. But it, it's always if you're a creative person, it's always on your, you know, it's you never get closure until it's done. <laughs> so you just think. You live in this bubble with this music, and you think, and you think, and you think, and when stuff is not, uh, you know, it, it can be can be pretty exhausting. Uh, but I was done. It was it was maybe one and a half years. Wow. Yeah. Uh, something like that. And were um, you recording from Canada at that point? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So well, we would move around a little bit. We'll go to uh, Cobra's parents, or we would be. Uh, they live out, out in BC on the coast. Oh, and, uh, Yeah, it was beautiful. And um, we would hang out with them for a little bit, and mm -hmm. I would bring my recording studio there. And uh, Cobra was working on her album out also in BC uh, with a producer. Mm -hmm. And I was there, and I recorded some songs there. And then we, we were back in Calgary, recorded some songs there. So it was, it was a long process. Mm-hmm. But I'm super stoked about it because I think it's it's really good. But um, yeah, and then right after I was done, basically the day I was done with the last recording, I started Seventh Wonder. So because it was on this really really short timeline, Seventh Wonder. Yeah. And then I had to pound that out for for a, two months or three months. Yeah. And how long are your recording sessions now? Super short. <laughs> <laughs> right. We talked about that eight or nine hour day was just not yeah, so good. It's not so. happening anymore. Yeah. Uh, a re do you do recording like two or three hours. Yeah, of singing, I would say. Something yeah. like that. And then That's a good amount. <laughs> it is a good amount. It's it, it's enough, <laughs> actually. Yeah. And um then and then I have to of course comp. I do everything myself. I comp myself and I Oh nice. I, I do all those things uh, until it's it's a finished vocal. So and you said that's in Cubase, right? Yeah, I work in Cubase. Cool, sure. cool, cool, cool. Where do you, how do you uh, record your stuff? I, I use Logic, uh, okay. Logic Pro. Yeah, and I like, I really like the, the comping system in there. Okay. Uh, but it's always You also comp? Yeah, yeah. 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 Exactly. You kind of feel like you have, like, if you want to have control of, over the outcome a little <laughs> bit, you, you kind of have to. <laughs> but I'm not, <laughs> I'm so picky about it. There's no yeah. way I'm going to let somebody else touch it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. I'm the same, same way. Right. Yeah. But it it would be nice to be able to to let it go. I have in the past a few times, like working on Camelot stuff. I I have yeah. let Sasha. Yeah. Do that uh, in the beginning, but I've come to the conclusion that I, I I'm never really fully happy until I can, I I I can have full control. Yeah, I've I've had people nudge me and say I should you know hand over some audio things to, to others as well that uh... <laughs> yeah it's hard. it's hard you gotta be really trusting yeah exactly exactly yeah. so then you said you did the seventh wonder album over a couple months two or three months i think it was three months that's pretty quick maybe. it was we didn't have i didn't have any melodies or or any, yeah anything pre prepared so usually the the what takes the longest for me is the actually writing the melodies to the point where I'm happy and it sounds unique or yeah. has something. Yeah. And, um, sometimes it goes fast. Sometimes I have to work a long time, like just to find the vibe that I want. 
Yeah. 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 And um, I feel like it's always strange when you have a muse hit you. Sometimes a song just will write itself in a few hours and yeah. the other ones end up being masterpieces that you've written over a month or two. And sometimes they're just total crap if you've written them over a month or two. Oh, I know. I know. And you, it's hard to be, the longer it goes, it's the harder it is to be objective or, or to, to know, like, is this really good anymore? Like, yeah. sometimes it, whatever comes out, the fir first thing that you would actually sing on it, it might be the best because it's aligned with, with your style or with what you want to say or how you feel. Mm -hmm. As... <laughs> It's the same thing if, if like the first, sometimes the first take mm -hmm. is the best take because you don't think, you just feel <laughs> and you just do. Mm -hmm. And then all the other takes are just shit after that. Yeah, totally. I, oh, that's so frustrating when you go back and you're, you're doing your comping and you say, well, shoot, I should have stopped after take one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it had, it had some magic, right? Right. Uh, yeah. So that's. Something I learned from Sasha, which is the producer for Camelot, he he would say, make sure you have the right lyrics when you're singing your guide. Mm. Because you only have a first a shot at the first of, the, of a first try once. And most of the time, there's some magic in the first first take. And if you don't have the right, right, right lyrics, you can't keep it. <laughs> That's some really good advice. Yeah, so make sure you have the the right lyrics when you try the first time. Yeah. yeah. So I, that's what I'm trying to do now. <laughs> yeah. Good. So what, uh, what can we expect from these albums coming up? I know you might not be able to tell us, you know, all the stuff they're not released yet, but uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about the journeys that might be found within. Yeah. Um, Seventh Wonder, uh, we, we went about things a little differently. We usually, or we have in the past done concept albums. Uh-huh. Um, where, where it has been more like an original story, uh, chronological order of things, uh, events and, and scenes, like in a movie, for example. Um, this one, we still felt like we wanted to do something more than just separate songs. So we we had the idea to, to base each song around one human emotion. Ooh. Uh, yeah. So there, there is a conceptual red thread somehow uh, tying them together, but it's not this, like the stories do not bleed into each other. They, um, it's just a, it's a different way, I guess, to mm -hmm. to approach it for us. Which was, it, you know, it's fun to have some kind of thread. Like, okay, now we're going to write about this. You know, mm -hmm. it's it's uh, easier than to just say, let's just write a lyric of what do you feel like writing about. <laughs> you know, <laughs> if you don't have anything. Uh, but, you know, and then we, Andreas, which is the bass player, he had an idea that we could name it a testament, kind of like what it is to be a human is, is these different emotions, right? So, so that's, that's what we, yeah, yeah what we, I like that. yeah, <laughs> and we had, I think we chose um, the ones, I mean, we didn't, we couldn't, uh, sing about all of them. We didn't have songs for all of them, but mm -hmm. we we picked the ones that felt the most natural to us as a group and how we write music and what we wanted to say and what we felt, you know, like it was, we picked those emotions. And, um, you know, because as you know, Sound Wonder has, has a more, maybe a little more uplifting vibe. Yeah, yeah it so an uplifting vibe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, uh, I think, you know, it comes natural, at least for me, to write about joy, hope, love. Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's other, of course, there's sadness. There's, this also comes very natural. And then I think the one that strayed too, too, like a little too further away from what we actually normally write about is anger and mm. uh, is emotions like that. It's not, we're not a very angry band, but. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do I write about this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. So that's, but that was a, a challenge uh, to make that emotion our own on the album. But. Yeah, I've always felt like, I'm also not a very angry person. I always felt like things that people, other people would get angry about, I would just 
usually get sad about it. And somebody once told me that anger and sadness were two sides of the same coin. Mm. Yeah, I guess they're very related. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's kind of how we, how we went about things. And uh, Andreas came over here because yeah, the pandemic, usually we would, we would be in the same city yeah. and we could meet up and, and do shorter sessions. Um, but this time he actually came here for a week and we, we, oh, nice. we wrote all the lyrics in a week, except for the ballad that I already had the, the, the I already had the lyrics for. Yeah. But we had, we wrote all the other lyrics in a week. Wow. Wow. Mm. That's a lot of lyrics to get in in one week. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and that usually like it would take me a couple of weeks per song, mm-hmm. you know, to figure out if, if I would write, it could take a couple of weeks mm-hmm. per song for me. Yeah. Do you feel like, you know, if you like this intensive lyric writing kind of approach now more, or is it still kind of too soon to tell? We had a lot, we had a lot of fun. Uh, it was, it was great. I mean, we write really good together and we feed off each other mm-hmm. in, a, in a creative way, which is really, really lovely, you know, to work with him. Yeah. Uh, and then it's like, oh, and then you know how you feel when that happens. And, and he's like, yeah, yeah, oh, oh, exactly. That's how I feel. And, <laughs> you know, it's, that's a great way of saying that. Or uh-huh. that's, that's really, really nice because sometimes you get stuck when you just sit with your own. Um, you just have yourself to to kind of dig with but yeah. uh so that was great i mean we did i was i wasn't even sure it's going to work to do that much work in, in a week you know mm-hmm. Her l- lyrics are so personal too but it really really worked and i think we we did some of our best work together that's great um yeah. this kind of leads into a question i wanted to ask which is what do you think makes a really good colleague and I asked this partly because I've seen you in lots of things with Arion as well. That was actually the very first time I heard you. Um, I think it was the day that the world uh, breaks down when you were seeing the opposition leader. Mm, I think yeah. that was the very first time I heard you. And it was great and instantly just stunning. Like, whoa, this guy's got a really good voice. So you've worked with, you know, a lot of different people at this point. So what, what do you think makes a good colleague? That's a good question. Um, well, well, I think you have to be willing to adapt to each other. Like you have to, you can't be stuck in your, in your way. Like if one person is like this, uh, and the other person is, is the only one who's trying to fit Hmm. Like this, it's not going to work so well, you know. So, but if both are trying to, okay, okay, we we find a way to work together. I think that's important. They have to be open to listen, <laughs> right? And, like uh, any good relationship. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. I think that's probably you know we have to be, uh, yeah, willing to adapt a little bit. I think, and then let the other person's strong suits. Um, come out like um, yeah I think that's yeah. I mean I've had so many wonderful colleagues and also looking back at my firefighting um, days I did 20 years of firefighting almost uh, with basically the same people uh, in the in one group during very interesting oh. times so I think you have to be humble be humble and uh, be, yeah, let people be who they are. It sounds like you have to develop a lot of trust too. Yeah, I mean, just to, you know, we would find ourselves in weird situations together for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but we did a lot of training. Like we, we, I think without the training, the sheer amount of the drills and, and things, which is the same as a band. Like if you if you're on the road forever, you get to know each other really well, because um, you have to. Like you're faced you're faced with different crowds, different. <laughs> you know, like you have to 
you ha you grow together, I think. And I think that's happen happening in groups. Yeah. yeah. And, and speaking of being on the road, um, I know that Seventh Wonder, I don't think, I don't think you ever done a tour of North America. Never tour, never a long tour, just uh, the Atlanta shows. I think we played with Seventh Wonder, the Prague Power shows. Yeah. Yeah. Is, are you thinking about doing something with the new album and maybe touring, maybe doing a few more shows? Possibly. <laughs> we'll have to see. We'll have to see. It has has never. We don't have a really huge following. Seventh Wonder. It's a. It makes it hard to tour. Uh, I know, and it's such a shame. I feel like it. It is one of, for me, one of the most underrated bands that I have covered, um, since I started my YouTube channel. Where I go, this a Seventh Wonder. I think should have, so many more diehard followers, and I'm. I'm very vocal about that with a lot of people too. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's awesome. Thank you for that little street street team. That's great. Yeah. We need that. We need all the support we, need, we can get. That's amazing. It's um, really, really good music. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, well, I think, yeah, going back to your touring question, I, mm -hmm. we we would love to play a few more shows in, in North America if we could make it economically feasible. That makes sense. Yeah. It's uh, we have fans spread out, but we need to get them to one to to a few places, and you know, like instead of we can't tour the whole the whole continent, like we don't have enough fans. Well, if you end up in Seattle at some point, I know quite a few people in that area, and we'll drag a bunch of people from our channel that, as <laughs> okay. well. So okay, just, great. Just let us know. <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. And then with Camelot, that album is going to come out probably later. 2022 maybe question mark is there any information about that right now uh well i know there's there's tours being planned for next spring yay and, uh, we would have to be um we would have to have the album out by then so that's that's i think as much as i know and, and dare to say you know, <laughs> right, some being untruthful <laughs> <laughs> yeah good. yeah so i think i think that's where where we're aiming at now to have a fresh album out by the tour season. And since that recording process was much longer, I'm guessing that the writing process also took place over a longer period of time than it did uh, for Seventh Wonder. It did this time around. Uh, it's usually the opposite uh, ah. dynamic. It's usually it takes forever to to make a Seventh Wonder, Seventh Wonder album um, because just of the, the, the complexity and, and actually us not being professional musicians all, of, all of the five of us right so mm -hmm. we are all having or now i don't but the other guys have have day jobs and you know i wasn't primarily in in camelot and had to um had to you know uh make myself available for that as much as i needed to because we are we are actually touring quite heavily touring yes band and and um so that had to be my first prior priority i mean there's no doubt about it and then seventh wonder had to like be the uh the the thing that i do in my spare time kind of mm -hmm. that made made it uh take a little longer you know of course but it's also a lot it's, it's complicated music it, it's uh you know people have to be able to play that play everything together and yeah you know, and yeah, so it takes a lot. It takes a lot of time. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it is very complicated music. <laughs> yeah, and and it can't be sloppy. It has to be well executed. If if with all these unison things in the music and all these arrangements, has to sound the basically the way they do on the album for it mm -hmm. to sound good. Otherwise, it sounds sloppy. So it's, it takes a lot of time. That makes sense. Well. Within the touring that you have done now, um, has there ever been a venue that really stuck out as being one of the best venues you've ever performed at? Venues, uh, yeah. I mean, I have a few favorite favorite venues that all, we always have good shows in. Uh -huh. um, and mostly then, I haven't done a lot of different venues with, with Seventh Wonder, that, uh, except for Prague Power, that venue is pretty great. Um, <laughs> but... Um, I'm thinking, I'm thinking uh, the Grove in Anaheim. Have you ever been there? Oh, 
I have never been there in person. I've heard tons about it though. Yeah, we usually end up there with Camelot, and uh, it's mm -hmm. uh, it's always, I don't know, it's something about it. And um, what else? I've done a lot of like one-offs that I liked. Like we played in in um, Japan. <laughs> uh, I can't remember what the what the venue was, but it's it's a great venue. Uh, I played a crazy venue with with the Finnish. Uh, Raska Stajolo. I don't know if you know that I, I okay, did. Uh, no, it's called Raska okay. Stajolo. It's a Finnish Christmas tour, kind of like. <gasps> oh, um, okay. I heard about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's kind of like uh, what's that uh, TSO, kind of, but in a Finnish, <laughs> Finnish uh, costume. Uh, we played a place called the Logomo in Tur. I think it's in Turku. Mm -hmm. And it's it's an amazing venue, like the craziest ve venue I've ever played. They have like some kind of acoustic system in the walls that you can Whoa. adjust. You can you can adjust the uh, um, the reverb time in the room <laughs> de depending on uh, what you're playing. If you're playing a classical orchestra of Spain or if you play a rock show, like you can. Uh -huh. And he he has an, an iPad. He can the guy he's just walking with an iPad. And he can change the acoustics in the room. That's so cool. That is very cool. Yeah. That's super awesome. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I, I feel like that would be a really, really fun environment to be in and listen to sound checks in. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I think, I think, yeah, he showed me. He's like, okay, now I'm going to put uh, this and this many milliseconds of reverb. And then he's like shouting out, and it's like the whole room is like, you know, and then he's like, I'm going to turn it off, and it's dead. Whoa. It's completely <laughs> dead. Yeah, so that yeah. was really cool. And I think that was not very, very cheap to install. But Probably not. Very cool, yeah. That's, yeah, super amazing. Wow. What, and then it becomes such a versatile venue for so many people to play at. Yeah, exactly. And you can really yeah. cater to. That was really cool. And they could move the back wall, I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, they could make the room bigger or smaller by moving the whole wall and with like seats and stuff too. So they could really make, they could really tailor make the venue. Like wow. no one would ever know. Yeah. That's such a, an amazing design. I wonder how, what that team was like when they were coming up with this thing. I really want a modular venue that can adapt to whatever kind of environment or band that we put in it. Yeah. Whoa. Oh. Yeah, it's really, really crazy. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Super awesome. And then uh, just, a, I think one more question for you, you know, we've, this is my favorite thing about conversations is when they do this. Yep. And, right? It's, it's so nice. Um, but I wanted to know um, what's the, what do you feel like the best and worst thing about being a singer? Because you're a singer. What do you feel like the best and worst thing is? Ah, okay. <laughs> I know. Oh, <laughs> the the best thing is that the best thing is that I get to express emotions on a professional level. I think tell a story. <laughs> tell a story like we were talking about earlier. Like uh, if I have something to say, I actually have an audience, um, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and. I don't know, actually know what I would do if I didn't do music. Uh, probably cutting trees or, I don't know, being out in the wilderness. <laughs> but fighting lots of fires. Fighting in lots of fires. <laughs> Tw two times a day, at least. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, no, I would, uh, that, that would, and I love, I love singing when, when I have, like, a good singing day. It's nothing more, you know, uh, rewarding in a way. Mm -hmm. The worst thing about being a singer, though, uh, is like, is as if someone would say to a comedian, "Please be funny. You, you're a comedian, right? Say something funny." Oh. You know, like, like you're a singer. Sing something. Right. Yeah, that's the worst thing. Because that, that I don't do that at all. Like I don't. I never do that. Mm -mm. Yeah. It, I part of being a singer for me is being well prepared or emotionally involved or something. I just don't sing because I'm a singer. I sing because I want to say something. 
Yeah, that's a good point. And it is, it's so true because you're carrying your instrument around with you all the time. People always expect that you're ready to just sing something. Wait, yeah, which is never the case, basically, for me. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's pretty rare. And it, I think especially when you have that introverted side, you say, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. introverted and perfectionist like you are going to work on that thing before you let it out yeah exactly and it how how is it for you what what would you say i don't know if anyone has asked oh, you yeah, they, they asked me to sing lots yeah um i i have mixed feelings when i when i hear that i often feel like ah <laughs> that that moment of uh, I'm not ready to just sing something right now. I haven't warmed up today. Right? All of the, yeah. those emotions. Um, but what would you say is the best thing about singing? Oh, like if I, if I ask you the same question, what's, what's your oh. best thing and what's your worst? Well, the worst thing for me, I, I know right away, is I just hate how variable the voice is. That it's in the body and so it just fluctuates no matter what I do. <laughs> it's so annoying. Can I add that to my list? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Right. Uh, I mean, even being pregnant right now, right? everything affects your voice. Everything. I believe it. I believe it. And so that's uh, that's been very challenging um, during pregnancy. And I've had to plan a lot of recording sessions around that, which is frustrating. But the worst thing, I think it's similar to what you said, uh, or sorry, best thing um, is just being able to uh, connect with an audience or just fundamentally have that human emotion experience together where you sing something and you know that maybe you've dug up some place in yourself that that's, has a really sad experience and you're sharing that with somebody and there's this cathartic release and you see them crying and you go like, yes, like, we're connecting and being human. <laughs> it's beautiful. Yeah. It's it one is, of those beautiful yeah. things. <laughs> Well, that's great. I mean, the the, the thing you said about um, um, before that that your your voice is unpredictable. Like the voice is very unpredictable. Mm -hmm. It can be so frustrating, especially when you're like on the on the road. Like like. Oh yeah. Uh, I really resonated with that because it's the voice is never sounding the same. Like it, it and it, it and it so small subtle nuances like if you're a little inflamed for, from something you ate suddenly you can't relax the same mm -hmm. way or it comes out sounding a little bit different so you have to you have to put it in a different place yeah uh, then you're used to with suddenly like it, it's so many variables like did you sleep did you drink water did mm -hmm. you did you uh, exercise before did you not did you so yeah, cracking that code is definitely a big, a big key to being consistent as a singer. Yes, and I think a lot of singers uh, get this label of being a diva or a devo or standoffish um, because they're trying to control their environment <laughs> because it's all affecting their vocal folds and their performance, and I don't think that many actually are or have i find that a lot of singers are really just pretty wonderful people yeah yeah <laughs> they turn into monsters because they have to <laughs> it's like oh no but really don't, i don't want cold air near my voice right now i'm so sorry yeah, <laughs> yeah. and yeah I, i've tried to i find that i was more crazy about that stuff before mm -hmm. i found i found if i do my preparations well in advance and I can actually relax. I I tend to do a better job consistency yeah. wise. Like I, if I'm not freaking out over details, yeah. And just do try to relax into it more uh, than to tense up and think, oh, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I need to do this. I need to do that. But it also those freakish moments come when you're feeling a little run down. Yeah. Anyway, you're like, what can I, like, suddenly I have to warm up much longer, or I have to change my routine in a certain way, and that affects if I can be trusting of my voice or not. It's it's very, mostly a mental game. Yeah. All the time, right? Yeah, completely, completely agree on all of those accounts. I, if you're able to let go of more, um, it tends to just be better overall, but the moment that something starts to get out of place, 
then uh, everything becomes, it can become a point of negative focus in some ways. Yeah. And what if I, if I can ask you mm -hmm. as an opera, opera singer, because you, you never basically, you don't go into grit or you don't, you don't alter your voice that way. It just has to be clean and, and yeah. uh, a certain way sounding. That must be very difficult uh, in a way because um, I, if I'm tired singing metal, I can, I can get away with a little grit if, oh. you know, or, or I can get away with something. But mm -hmm. I feel like it's very exposed. If you're an opera singer, you, it's not like you can hide in the music or, or do something different. You just have to sound like an opera singer. Yeah, I, that's interesting. I it Also because grit, I think I have a lot of respect. I've developed a lot of respect for how that's made in healthy ways too now. I, I used to think that it was bad. As we were trained, I think that grit often is not good, but uh, that's definitely not always the case. <laughs> definitely not usually the case, I'd even say at this point. But um, I think one of the things that becomes really apparent when when opera singers start to get tired is a little more air escaping or um, sometimes singers will just start to sing loud all the time. That breath pressure makes it easier to hit higher notes. And so maybe the high floaties will go away or dynamic mm. range will go away. Oh, there's all kinds, or if you're having more air escapes, sometimes your notes won't be held as long. <laughs> so right. Both right. kinds of things, or maybe on bad days, I'd plant extra breaths in various places, or mm. uh, if I was singing like Violetta, which is one of the really, you know, big common uh, leading ladies that I would sing, a lot of times she has a high E flat at the end, and if it's not such a good day, you can do a B flat option instead, right? So kind of like okay. you, you have embellishments that you do that are- Totally, yeah. That you and might they... switch up during a run. They help for sure. I'm not as <laughs> I'm not as uh, gung ho anymore uh, on doing exactly like it was on the album. Like I I would mm -hmm. do that to a fault before. Uh, really? And then, at the more I toured, the more I understood that it's actually not matter. It doesn't actually matter um, if I do exactly what I did. Like it can. It can definitely help me sometimes if I if I do a variation or if I do a run or if I if I let the audience sing or like it's so many options that we have mm -hmm. in live because I think most of the, most people they they play their CD in their head at the same time as they yeah. as they hear the so you, many times if you have a great audience you don't even have to sing that much. <laughs> you <know>? okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I've been for example in uh, in Chile once. Uh, they just blow us, blew us away, like with how they. Th it was the loudest thing I've ever heard in my life. We couldn't oh. hear anything what we were doing on stage. It probably sounded like absolute shit. But, <laughs> and I couldn't hear what key I was singing in, and nothing. We just heard the audience, but they were so happy, and they sang every word. So, oh, that's gotta feel. You know, great. It, it it felt amazing, even though I was beating myself up because I thought I was really not doing a good job uh, singing, but it didn't matter. And that's how you learn, I think, a little bit too. You you just you just have to learn to go with it a little bit and, and do mm -hmm. and be in the moment and it's actually the, the it's not the performance all all the way that matters, it's the connection with the people that matters. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's so much more important to connect with your audience and sing a perfect note. Yeah. One hundred percent. Well, I have a few patron questions. Okay. Um, and the first one is going to be from Grail. He's the one that introduced me to Seventh Wonder and the Beat Saber thing. So anyhow, okay. really, really fun person. Um, so he wanted to say, many of Seventh Wonder songs and albums tell tragic stories or have bittersweet endings. Why did you and the band choose to write tragedies rather than stories with more cheerful endings? And what aspects of performing tragedies do you prefer as a vocalist? <laughs> oh. it's a, it's a, actually that's a tough one i mean i think it just happened to be honest like uh, it just um i remember writing the the synopsis together with andreas uh for mercy falls the album mercy falls mm -hmm. we were sitting in my apartment at the time 
Uh, and it was really fast. You know, the synopsis came really fast. Uh, we divided it into songs. and But we thought it would be, would be great to not do the Hollywood ending for that album. Like, uh, to, to have it resolve in a perfect... Um, yeah, in something happy rather than do something different, right? Like to to you know keep people on the toes, it uh, not do the predictable thing. So yeah, we we it ended with maybe a little bit of a tragedy there. But then again, um, for Tiara, for example, it's the opposite. You know, when you think everything goes goes to to hell at the end, mm-hmm. uh, it's actually there's. This this uh, little yeah this is the <laughs> moment of of like oh did she move her fingers like is she actually still alive you know like something hopeful in the end so uh-huh. it's actually the polar opposite there but yeah we it it's again playing with emotions like uh, you can do that in a in a uplifting way you can do that in a somber way and I think we we like to explore those those things that's cool. <laughs> Gerald Freeman wanted to know, how did it feel to replace a living legend? Were you a fan of Roy when you joined Camelot? Um, I'm going to ask the, answer the, the last question first. Uh, I was not, if, I didn't really know who he was. Wow. Because, um, again, I didn't come from a metal background. Uh-huh. I like, uh, came from pop. So, yes, I, w- I would have known who Michael Jackson was, but I didn't know who Roy Cohn was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But so I, I would say I wasn't a fan, but when I started the band I, and I, I, I started in the band and um, had to learn what he did and how he sang and, and you know, the legacy of Camelot, I, I became a fan because um, I thought he was doing really good stuff. Uh, yeah. And um, I really respect musicians that can write and perform and, and do it in a different way that maybe comes innately to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I it became a fan. Yeah, that that's really cool. I I love, I love that. I love that you have that background. That's a little bit different. It it again makes your voice just so unique within this space. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was the other question? It was how oh, does it feel? How does to... it feel to replace a living legend? Yeah. We talked a little bit about that vocally, but I'm I'm curious emotionally too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I had to warm up to it because once I knew kind of, you know, like it's a, it was a bigger band than, than I had ever been in. It was a really respected singer. Uh, I, I, the nature of me is to not take on something that I don't think I can handle. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had to, had to um, brew in me for a little bit. Uh, and I had to really dig in and see, can I, do I think I can do a good job? I don't want to take it on and not do a good job. It's not an option. So, but, but I figured out that I think I can do this and I, I think I can contribute with something of my own and uh, make it my own and, and, and differentiate, differenti- what do you call it? Differentiate? Differentiate. Yeah. Uh, uh-huh. My, Oof. yeah. It's, uh, I, I think I can do that and make it my own and, and make my own persona that, that is separate from him, you know, but still mm-hmm. carry his legacy. Uh, he, all the all the, the old albums that are amazing, they still exist. Yeah. I'm not taking those away. I'm going to do my absolute best to honor them, but then I will try to bring my own flair into it and we can go, we can move forward together, together with the fans and and, uh, and create some new stuff. I think you've done a really extraordinary job. That, that's, those are big shoes to fill and you, yeah, you've done it. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, our notes, Nader Pelt wanted to know, Camelot has done some great collaborations with other accomplished artists like Simone Simons, Alyssa White, White Glues, and Elise Ridd. Can you share something about how these collaborations work? and how you do justice to the skills of these artists when writing the song. That was another one of the ones that I've seen that collaboration too. It was just like blew my mind when I saw all three of you working together. And I loved the, like the 
angel demon sort of opposites in the way you're seeing with them in that. Anyhow, yes. So, um, <laughs> yeah. How do they work? Yeah. Well, um, usually I would, I would, uh, if the, if I write a, a, a vocal part for a girl, I would try to just, um, first of all, put it in the right range. Like <laughs> yeah, if, that's helpful. if we can, <laughs> yeah. So for working with Elise, uh, on sacrimony, mm -hmm. her part, uh, for example, uh, we need a call for a key change, for example, in the, oh, yeah. in the chorus towards the end, I think, right? I, uh -huh. I think it's a key change in there. Well, there are lots of key changes, but <laughs> yeah, I, I have to think about it, but I think it's either that or liar, liar. One of them has a key change to fit, um, the female part because, uh, mm -hmm. it's a little low if, if it, as you know, a, a girl sings a little higher. Uh, register so for it to sound natural mm -hmm. after we had to you know make a make a part that or do the chorus transposed I think up three half steps or something um, but then I, I just uh, when I write for a girl that's the that's the main thing and then I I sing a guide in falsetto oh okay, uh, yeah. just to you know try to simulate a girl <laughs> a girl voice uh, <laughs> uh, I might add some like runs and stuff in there to see you know if they can do them, they, they can <laughs> do them. but uh, yeah so that's kind of how that goes and then what about for the for Hirsch vocals um, for death growls and working mm -hmm. with Alyssa how did that work out uh, same way I just would simulate uh -huh. something and send a demo yeah but uh but I can't, I can't uh, growl. Like I'm, I can't growl. So and you I don't, like whisper and sound. I would whisper or growl that hurt my voice, you know, or, mm -hmm. or Sasha would growl. Uh, <laughs> he has a little more of a growl, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so he would, he would make the demo with Sasha as the producer. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but then we just send files nowadays, mostly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> usually it turns out good. That's fun. That's some fun insight. Yeah. And, and I think it makes a lot of sense too to make the guide in falsetto. That's going to have a little more similarities uh, to female voice timbre as well. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I also like singing the falsetto. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like it would feel so nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And is it, I don't know so much about uh, the technicalities, but um, girls don't have falsettos the same way like guys have. It's not this, it's, um, it's kind of a fuzzy area, but I can, mm -hmm. I can make it clear scientifically, but it becomes fuzzy sensation wise for women. Guys have a really often definitive break mm -hmm. between full voice and falsetto that they, they really notice. Most guys do not mm -hmm. all, but women, um, you have chest voice and head voice, and there's a pretty big break between those that maybe aren't as big uh, or isn't as a big distinction for guys. And then, Technically, women can sing in falsetto, but we didn't actually know that mm. until we had a camera down somebody's throat and went, oh my gosh, this person singing in falsetto because uh, falsetto and head voice are, they feel so similar in Close, sensation yeah. to women. And these days, a lot of times pop um, music will talk about singing in falsetto for women and they'll just essentially mean like okay. a light head voice. Mm. Um, mm. Okay. The physical creation of falsetto, um, when like a part of the laryngeal muscles essentially disengage and another part is very, very dominant. Both yeah. males and females can do it. They just feel it differently. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I feel very distinct. Distinct. Uh, I think, yeah, like you said, male singers. Yeah. Have a more yeah. distinct, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, almost a flip. Yeah, almost a flip. Mm -hmm. And then you can totally. learn how to how to blend all the way. You can do it seamlessly if you know what you're doing. Like, uh, <laughs> if you know. <laughs> yeah, if you know. I I had a really I saw a really good tutorial. Uh, this is a Swedish vocal coach. I saw like he he described chest voice, head voice, and uh, falsetto uh, as 
like many people think that this, these are different voices. You can do, you can either sing in chest voice or you can sing in head voice. You can sing in falsetto. But then he had demonstrated going, going from chest voice uh-huh. into falsetto and then gliding back and forth like this, mm-hmm. which means that actually it's an infinite amount of voices on the way uh, that yeah. you can blend. And if you practice that, you get a little bit better at, at seamless, seamlessly switching between those nuances, I guess. And you can, yes. yeah. I yeah, think which was the glides, when you do glides and you're able to sort of smooth out any transitions all the way, that's one of the best indications, I think, of a person who's really worked on stitching a voice together very well. Um, and it, it absolutely can be done. It's just, it tends to take a lot of little adjustments and work. Yeah. And it's a, it's a scary thing because we don't want to crack and we don't want to <laughs> like it. It's so it, we're tense up, which makes it even harder. But yeah. I think, uh, I think if you can just like lose the judgment and relax and then practice those things, I think that that's probably very, very helpful for Much agreed. people that want to be free. Yeah. Much agreed. Yeah, totally. Uh, let's see. Grunkle Runa wanted to know. Out of all of the amazing performers you've had, you have worked with, who were your most, or who, sorry, I just messed that up. Out of all of the amazing performers you have worked with, who were you the most in awe of? Oh. (laughs) Oh. Bruna really nailed that question. I like it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my God, that's- Starstruck moment, right? (laughs) <laughs> Starstruck mode. Well, it's easy to, you know, it's easy to recognize when someone has really put their, um, apart from my wife, I'm going to, I'm going to put my wife aside, you know, cause it's, it's very cool to sing with her. Uh, I'm in awe with all, all of all her stuff. Uh, <laughs> but, um, except apart from Cobra, I would say, this guy called Mike Mills. Oh, Michael Mills. Uh, the, yeah. And he was in uh, The Source with you, right? Yeah. It's just, he's just a, <laughs> a freak. Like uh, yeah. how, you know, his range. And you, you tend to really be in all of the stuff that you can't do so well. And uh, that's kind of what I think. Like when I hear him, his, he has no limits of what he can do range-wise, <laughs> right? And I, I don't consider Thanks. myself having a crazy range or anything. I just, I just uh, I have a, a wide palette of things I can do with my voice, but I, mm-hmm. I don't necessarily have the craziest range, I don't think. Mm. Um, but he has a crazy, crazy range. And of course, uh, that's very, he has worked on that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, how to harness that. So I, I, that was really cool. Like hearing him sing live, all these crazy things. That's the blew my mind. Yeah. That's, I, and that was a performance that I also um, analyzed at one point was, I think, of both of you singing live for the source. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> oh, he's, cool. he's, he's a crazy, crazy singer. Very, very humble, very down to earth, very nice guy, too. So <laughs> I uh, want nothing for the best, nothing but the best for, for Mike, for sure. That's awesome. That's awesome. And I think there's, um, as far as I've seen it in the Arion, universe and all of the different artists that have been brought in it seems like there is a a mutual respect and just kindness as far as i've seen among singer colleagues yeah it's been very nice every every time i've been uh, just we, we did the live dvd i think that's one the one you're uh you're uh, talking about and uh, that yeah. was really nice we had a couple of days together there's no way to stop it Do the world go through? None will be spared. So don't just shoot that ragged girl with your silver spoon. You'll roll the same when extinction looms. The food supply, the water supply, the power supply, the water supply. No compromise. Say goodbye, and everybody dies. No clarification, no information, no justification, forget the why, just open your eyes, everybody dies. And then we did another show uh, at a festival that I also was a part of, which was also very oh. fun. I mean, they're all nice, really nice people, similar experiences. It's, uh, you know, and being among those people, 
uh, other singers that that way. You see what they kind of do when they warm up, or you know, uh -huh. all friendly and wanting to share. And you know, it's 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 good. I kind of go hide somewhere, but <laughs> the other people are very nice. <laughs> <laughs> they're all in the green room and you're back, back in a dressing room going singing on straws <laughs> exactly and like i since i hate i don't really want people to hear me warm up or anything i tend i tend to like run away somewhere do <laughs> like a, uh, a basement or you know mm -hmm. yeah so mm -hmm. and then i come out when i'm when prepared i don't want to i don't want to sound you know some people don't care about that i care about that yeah, I I never could get over that too. Um, I still, there's still a little apprehension of somebody listening to me warm up because that's when you're working all the kinks in your voice out. Right? Yeah, it sounds like shit most right? of the time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and it sounds weird, which is why I like singing on a straw in a hotel room. <laughs> if you're gonna do a concert somewhere, sing through a straw. It's gonna sound weird the whole time. No one will know anything other than there are weird noises next door. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But how does it work in the in the opera? Like, uh, do you have rooms that you can like, you can go yeah. warm up and then no one is in or? Um, yeah, if you're a lead character, usually you have your own your own dressing room. Um, but it kind of depends on the company and the space. And there have been times when there was less space, or you know, you're doing a concert kind of in a weird place, and it it's just the warm up is not going to be relaxed. So. Most of the time for me, before I would get to the venue, I would warm up somewhere else or I would get there really early before anybody else was there so I could sort of have an initial warm up mm. and then I wouldn't sing for a couple hours and then I would do like five or ten minutes right before going on stage. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I, that's another part where I, I feel like since I warm up singing to songs, like mm -hmm. like I gradually sing a little tougher songs, like... Um, yeah or sections of songs. I, I have my headphones on because I don't want to hear myself. <laughs> so, and then I also don't hear other people, right? So I, yeah. I can fool myself that I'm alone. Yeah, there. <laughs> <Yeah>, exactly. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So then I relax a little more and then I bet people hear me, but yeah. The movie they know by now that they're, they're not supposed to tell you. That exactly. They, you. they don't tell me. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> fun. Yeah. Emily wanted to know, You've mentioned that you would like to do a solo album one day. I was wondering what genre of music it would likely be, and would it be in Swedish or English or both? I wonder that too. <laughs> you know, that's my one of my biggest uh, things that I'm thinking about right now is uh, oh. actually making uh, making a, a solo album and or one or two. I mean, I don't know. That's the question. Would I sing in English? Would I sing in Swedish? That very that's very dear to me. Would I sing acoustic music, which I which I have thought about for sure. Like that's definitely one way because I love singing acoustic stuff. I think mm -hmm. it's easy to sing over. It comes very natural to me in my voice. Uh, or do I do something that I that people expect from me? Something more metal, more. You know, do I do progressive? I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I've started a little bit fiddling around, and, and I think I'm just going to keep writing and see where it goes. But definitely some some solo stuff is on the horizon, for sure. That's awesome. And now that you've just recorded for both of the big bands, yep. maybe there's a little more space to do it. Yeah, exactly. I just have to work my uh, my will to do it up a little bit <laughs> like my energy and my because yeah. uh, I yeah, as I mentioned before I, I get pretty tapped after each each uh, project like I have to uh, I think it's called inspiration because, because it comes from the outside in <laughs> and uh, I think I have to wait until I get some more inspiration before I start so I'm not completely empty yeah. Yeah, and it makes sense that you've exhausted yourself. It's that introverted thing where you've expended the energy, and now it's just like, whoa. Mm. Yeah. Yes. And now we have to recoup. have to recoup. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. but I'm I'm getting to the point where I think I can see the light again. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it would be really lovely, and I I look forward to I look forward to hearing what it is you decide to put out because I know you'll be a perfectionist about it and. 
I feel like we'll be yeah. surprised. Yeah, it could be. It could be surprised. I feel mm -hmm. like it could be a, li a little less progressive. Mm -hmm. And um, we'll see. Mm -hmm. See, well, I'm, 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 uh, I'm uh, excited to see where, where it takes me to. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, every time you've talked about your wife, I just see this beaming love and, and adoration. So I'm all for I'm all for hearing a love song that you wrote. To oh, me. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that has to happen at some point. Right? It's like kind of essential. So, Cobra, we we have to do a <laughs> we have to do a song together. She's like, "Absolutely." Yeah. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Yeah. We have a request. <laughs> Yay. I love it. David Rivetti, aka Quirky Uncle Dave, wanted to know, <laughs> for about 20 years, you had overlapping careers as a firefighter and as a professional singer. Do you see any parallels in how you developed your skills and your approach in each of those careers as you gained experience or any lessons you carried over from one to the other? Well, I always considered firefighting being like a, a, pro a constant work in progress and uh, because you never um, there's never enough things you can learn like you can always learn more things because the technology changes houses change uh, like you're never fully educated which was the, the big challenge like you ha always have to educate yourself every day something new you have to learn or re repeat like go back and relearn something that you forgot or like, mm -hmm. so it's co a constant uh, progress, like learning in progress, which I think is the same. You, you can never give up. You always have to go for it every day if you want to be in the profession. I think it's maybe a little bit the same way with music. Yeah. You, um, you know, and that, maybe that's a, a more of a, natural progression like you have to you can't do the same thing for 20 years because you're not the same person so you have to adapt a little bit to the new person that you become for with sure. the music that you make yeah so maybe maybe those things and then you have to work your ass off to get anywhere <laughs> right like uh, yep. <laughs> it's not gonna come to you and and you just have to work for it and I think that's a little bit similar too. Yeah. That's good. I, yeah, work I'm ethics. Thinking. Work yeah. ethics from both. Yeah. I'll carry yeah. that with you. Definitely. I, I was waiting to ask a firefighter question until after mm -hmm. Dave's question. Did you ever notice smoke affecting your voice after firefighting? 100%. Oof. That seems like it'd be yeah. really difficult to manage. It was. And I, I think... The first, at least the first 10 years we had, you know, we would be less careful about um, how much smoke we, we were breathing in. You know, we were in, we were, for example, we, we, we went into a fire, the fire was put out, you would walk around in the, in the environment with your clothes, which would mm -hmm. soak up all these uh, yeah, things. Like, you know, you'd be, if you did like, like this, you'd be like a big cloud of things. <laughs> yeah. And and then no one was thinking twice about it. We were just jumping into the car together, five people in the car, and like, uh, you know, you you wouldn't wash. I wouldn't wash my clothes or like my um, my clothes that I actually went into the fire with. I wouldn't wash them after every time. I would I would leave them for months and months, accumulating all these things. You know, and so it would smell like a, a fire in the fire house, you know, from all this yeah. stuff. It was way better after 10, at like 10 years in or something, we started having procedures for, like we would put all the clothes into bags right away after fire, change clothes, like put them in the, in the special washing machine, you know, like mm -hmm. having a certain room for, for all the gear before we put it back on the, uh, you know, when we clean them and put it back on the trucks and stuff. So for a good 10 years, I think I, I, I was breathing in mostly just really crappy stuff. And I think it definitely affected my, um, affected my voice. Like it's very greasy. It's greasy and uh, yeah, soot, 
you know it's like yeah it's, it gets into your airways and i don't think it's good. irritating right yes yeah it's irritating it definitely would affect my voice and um also the not sleeping or the the bad sleeping habits like mm. waking up in the middle of the night four times and trying to sing the day, the next day is like mm, it's not gonna go so well <laughs> right those two lifestyles uh, would definitely not work for an opera singer <laughs> so yeah no I, I don't yeah i was happy i was in metal and it could sound a little <laughs> shitty <laughs> like oh there's some rocks to the voice today that's okay <laughs> yeah totally but so that's like i'm happy that i'm not in that profession anymore because of that because because of because of uh, how it affects the health a little bit if you're not careful yeah. and how it's actually heavy on the on the body uh, to not sleep the way your body is supposed to sleep i think and yeah. i'm healthier now i'm healthier now even though even though I, um, uh, I miss it, you know? Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 Uh, and then our last question is going to come, um, from always who wants to know uh, another thing about, uh, firefighting actually, but there's several things in here. Anyhow, you're also known for being a tough firefighter, helping old ladies cross the street and rescuing cats from trees. But when it comes to nature and science, you just use the firefighter approach and use a water spout for the itsy bitsy spider. Who's the real tough and fierce person at home? Is it you or your wife, Cobra? Oh, that's, <laughs> that's uh, definitely Cobra. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a softie for sure. She's a softie too, but she, um, we, we complement each other. Like I am very risk adverse, um, grounded and calm and, um, uh, and uh, and usually not so impulsive um and uh to a fault most of the mm -hmm. time and then she can be she's very fiery very <laughs> impulsive very go-getter and uh she does she she takes risks you know because that's the way she grew up and and i really respect that and i think we bring we we bring out you know the best of each other because we we complement each other like when we've talked about it, i can be the rock that holds her down when she's being a kite and she's uh, she can take me with her <laughs> when i'm being a stuck uh grumpy head <laughs> grumpy head <laughs> that's super sweet I yeah totally i think so <laughs> yeah i think so and um <laughs> i think yeah she's making me a better person for sure Oh, that's, and that's what you find in the best partnerships is that you grow together and you make each other better people. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, before, before we finish up, I need to know how can I and all of our viewers support you the most? Where can we find your music? Where, um, you know, do you have Patreon available to you? How can we support you as an artist and your bands? Ah, it's a good question. I don't have Patreon, uh, but uh, I think just come out and, and see us play when we when we uh, are making an effort to come out and play because it, it definitely isn't easy nowadays. Mm, uh, yeah. And um, we got to make all the all the moments count together. I think. That's um, true. Yeah, and then every time we release something try to keep an open mind and uh, uh, cause, cause we're not, I mean, I know how it is. Uh, when, you know, you, you can have a favorite band and you want them to always sound like that, but, but they will evolve because they evolve as human beings, right? Like yes. they will, you gotta be open to also evolve with your favorite artists. Otherwise not going to work, you know, like in the long run. Yeah. Uh, I'm not the same person I was 20 years ago. I'm not putting out the same music. So, you know, having that in mind, it's probably a good thing that people, they develop in different grow together ways. Yeah, <laughs> we can grow together. Exactly. And, uh, I will, I will try my best to put music out for a long time to come. And, um, uh, if, if that comes in a solo shape or, or with a band, it's yet to be, uh, 
yet to be decided, you know, but mm -hmm. as for now, we have a Seventh Wonder album coming out. We have Camelot coming out. So it's a lot of music coming your, your guys' way and yeah, just um, enjoy it and have fun with it and uh, come out, see mm -hmm. us play, I would say. Is there, in particular, is there a best place to get those albums? Uh, or, you know, sometimes I think as consumers, we don't know what, what funds actually get back to you. Sometimes we think, oh, you know, if I watch it on YouTube a bunch of times, maybe that'll get back or, you know, yeah. watch the ads or, you know, band campus. I know a place that a lot of artists have said they can get extra help from. Is there a good source to support you more from? Um, well, I think just make sure that you actually buy the music, you know, it, it, there you go. And, you know, or sign up to mm -hmm. streaming platform or it definitely helps us if, if people legally buy the music, right? Like, yes. um, it's not the eighties anymore. It's not huge. We, no one is rich anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know? That's not a thing for artists. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a thing anymore, but, uh, definitely, you know, what, what counts for us is that someone actually respects our art and, uh, and pays a few bucks for for the for the art we we made so that we can continue making art. Uh, yeah. Well said. Yeah. Go out and yeah. buy that buy the album. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I That's like the that. best. Good. Well, thank you so very 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 much for um, taking time to chat with me today. Uh, it's amazing to learn more about you and and your journey, and especially awesome to hear how you worked through some of those vocal problems. I love that you use the straw. And then yeah. I also feel like we just had a really good time chatting some life philosophy. And Absolutely. Well. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for, for uh, having me. It was amazing. And uh, I wish you all the luck, the best of luck with, uh, with the continuation of your YouTube channel and journey, Patreon, and everything. All the things. Thank you very, very much. And I definitely look forward to hearing you um, whenever Seventh Wonder decides to uh, you know, give a live concert in Seattle, for example. That'll be really fun. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's wait for that day. Right. Hope that, yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Cheers, Elizabeth. Too. Cheers. <laughs> this was great, though. This tea, tea was uh, really good. Right? Oh, oh, yeah. Perfect. I think I had too much tea in it, but it taste is so good. <laughs> Perfect. Mm. <laughs> Fresh and fruity. Right. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Cheers to awesome tea. <laughs>